Um, so yes, before we get started with our next speaker, I realized um, that I was just so excited to get started in this afternoon that I thanked and acknowledged our funders, the, the CRM and CANSI, um, but I didn't actually introduce myself or my co-organizer, Michael Wallace. So I am Erica Moody from the University of McGill, um, and Michael Wallace is my, my partner in crime here for today's event. He's at the University of Waterloo. So welcome. We are happy to have you joining us. And our next speaker this afternoon is Irene Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen is an incoming professor, assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley and University of California, San Francisco with joint appointments in computational precision health and electrical engineering and computer science. So she'll be talking to us today about uh, ethical machine learning in healthcare. Amazing. It is an absolute joy, bonjour tout le monde, um, to be here today. And um, I think without further ado, I'll just jump right in. Um, I'm so excited today to present. I always tell people that we need more events like this, which is to say practical ways to think about data ethics. And for people who are analysts or practitioners, or even just curious about how to be more thoughtful about the analytics that we do. Um, and I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to share my research with you today. Um, so I have about four 45 minutes of material prepared. Um, and then I imagine we will have a regroup for the panel later in the afternoon. Um, also, I'd like to give a special shout out to my collaborators who are listed in very small font on the bottom, but without whom um, this research would not be possible. It is unfortunate that there are so many of them and the font must be then therefore so small, but I am truly grateful for all of their help and support. Let's get down to business though. So um, machine learning, has this opportunity to fundamentally change healthcare. That is the field that I work in specifically, although I imagine a lot of people on this call may be working on many different kinds of uh, machine learning, analytics, data science type tools. Today, I'll be focusing mainly on healthcare. We may be interested in building algorithms to, for example, develop better clinical interventions or a better understanding of human health, all of which are very valuable goals to work towards. And the moment is ripe right now because we have this opportunity where the field is experiencing a time of great change in progress. There is a variety of available data in different modalities, sizes, feature sets. Um, and although today we'll focus primarily on that first one, electronic medical records, where most of my day, uh, my research is focused on, there, I want to emphasize that there are so many other sources out there that you may be working on or people you know or people you may see, um, and I think it's, it's a very, very exciting time. This new data and these advances in computational um, power have led directly into, for example, FDA-approved medical applications in the U.S. So the Food and Drug Administration is the regulatory body that licenses and approves algorithms in the healthcare setting. And as you can see from this graph, although it's cut off in the first half of 2021, um, the, the sort of trend is exponential as we have more and more AI, meta and ML enabled medical devices that are being approved. With all of these advances in deep learning and all of the availability of data, there are still some technical and data challenges that are keep popping up. And more often, they're very specific to healthcare. For one thing, data is very limited and sparse in the healthcare setting, meaning although there's a lot of different types of data, there's very large data sets, there's often missing in, uh, missing data and censorship. So in one well-cited type 2 diabetes and prediction model, four of the 10 features used had over 50% of the data missing. This missingness is often not random either. Researchers have found that the time that the lab test is ordered, for example, in the middle of the night, is more important than whatever the value is itself. If a nurse is waking you up to get a lab test measurement, then it is a high likelihood that you are already in a state, your, your health state is already severe enough that, that, it's, that the waking up and the taking it is itself a sign that you're in a severe state. Forget what the actual lab test says. Um, there is also a lot of treatment variation. So across hospitals, across clinicians, um, breast cancer treatments may vary by geographic area, as researchers have found by hospital protocol, different hospitals have different protocols. And in the US, there's a large disparity based on what kind of insurance type you are, as unfortunately, people in the US have a lot of um, financial considerations as well. 
even for the same risk profile of, of patients. Um, and then lastly, I just want to call out that healthcare is not a solved problem by any means. So in the New England Journal of Medicine, they found that 13% of all published medical practice papers were in fact reversals, meaning they count, uh, contradicted existing known medical knowledge. My research focuses on questions of equity and fairness, something that I imagine is great of great interest to this crowd. And when we start to bring these kinds of questions into the picture, we find even more technical and data challenges. Um, healthcare, as it's currently practiced, is not equitable. Um, there was a great New York Times article that came out, I think, last week um, that showed that Black women who gave birth had worse outcomes. Um, so women, Black women who were in the top socioeconomic status quintile had worse outcomes than white mothers in the worst socioeconomic status quintile. Um, even So even after you adjust for socioeconomic status, um, you have great disparities. The data that we choose to collect can be skewed as well for genome-wide association studies, um, these large data sets that are prized for their size and how they might impact population health have been shown to have selection bias issues. Um, in 2008, researchers found that 96%, 96% of participants of your, are of European descent. What does it mean when the population that we collect does not in any way reflect the population of the world in which we hope to have impact? Um, the reason that these sample sizes become problematic is especially true when different subpopulations face differences in the data distribution. For example, heart attacks present differently for women than for men, and this can affect differences in treatment. So with a biased existing healthcare system creating biased data, is it any wonder then that we're starting to see more and more examples of algorithmic bias and bias audits start to pop up? Um, I Today, I'd like to talk about the entire machine learning pipeline from the problem selection stage all the way down to what happens after you deploy an algorithm. Unfortunately, I only have time to talk about two things. So these are the last two steps, the algorithm development and the post-deployment considerations. But my research, I would note, sort of spans the whole gamut. And specifically, I want to talk about two projects, and I hope give you some tools or at least a framework to think about your own analyses and how we can think through and be, become more ethical in our data analysis. So one, I'm going to talk a pro look at a project of um, a bias audit, an equity audit for machine learning, and specifically how we can decompose sources of discrimination, take a, magno a microscope, let look towards this discrimination. And the second project will think about how we can expand beyond the mathematical definition of fairness to think about how we can build uh, ideas of equity directly into the machine learning model. So here we're talking about differences in access to care and how that might confound results. Um, but let's go ahead and get started with the first project. So the first project looks at how to decompose sources of discrimination. Uh, in this project, I'm going to walk through an example of what to do if you find that your algorithm is discriminatory. And specifically, I want to explain how we can estimate the sources of this discrimination. And then by relation, the corresponding solutions. Um, this is all going to be using a concept that you may have learned in the first week of machine learning class, for example, a very simple statistical decomposition. Um, and the clinical motivation sort of to set the scene of the application I'll be talking about specifically um, is risk stratification for clinical interventions. A key step for clinicians is to identify patients who have higher or lower risk of an adverse event. For example, um, APGAR scores are used on every newborn. It's, uh, it's very possible that everyone in the Zoom chat has been risk stratified at birth for um, a, to determine if you as a newborn were higher or lower risk um, based on some visible signs. These risk stratifications though can be incorrect for different subpopulations. And that's what we're finding, meaning that if they have um, two patients can have divergent risk estimates for patients uh, they can have divergent risk estimates, even if they have the same risk profile, meaning that these risk stratification models might not be so correct. Um, and specifically, I want to look at the intensive care unit. So the ICU has a lot of moving parts, um, a lot of very seriously ill people, and it's important to design risk stratification here for clinicians. Um, specifically in this project, I looked at predicting hospital mortality from ICU notes. So as clinicians were making these unstructured text notes, how could we predict 
the possible mortality from those notes. Um, I did what any young researcher or you know wants uh, dreams of, which is I got access to this large data set. I polished off my my trusty logistic regression on a bag of words, sort of a very basic elementary model, just to see what would happen. And to my surprise, I found statistically significant differences in algorithmic performance. Here on the y-axis, we have patient self-reported race, and the x-axis, we have the zero-one loss. You can think of it as the error. And here we have a 95% confidence interval for um, the error performance for each group. And what you see is that not all of the intervals are overlapping. And in fact, some of them are quite non-overlapping. Hence, the model could be, could, could be interpreted as being discriminatory. The relevant question becomes why? What's going on then? Taking a step back, I want to actually define fairness. I've been using these words very loosely, bias, fairness, equity. And here, I want to define fairness in the context of loss functions, loss metrics for two groups. So although there are many mathematical definitions, this generalized form um, covers a majority of concerns that clinicians have raised with me about the kinds of things that they're most interested in here. So roughly at a high level, we're taking the outcome Y, the prediction Y hat, and some data set D, and we're computing a loss, a loss value. For example, the zero one loss or the error. Meaning, if you predict correctly, the uh, the prediction and the outcome. If the uh, if you predict incorrectly, the prediction and the outcome don't match. Um, we want to figure out what the loss is for each group um, A for for some group A. Then we formalize the definition of unfairness as the absolute value of the differences. So little gamma here is the zero one loss, and then big gamma here is the absolute value of the differences between gamma one, little gamma one, and little gamma zero. Note that we're relying on accurate and unbiased Y labels here, and we're specifically focusing on algorithmic error. One way to decompose unfairness would be to examine, as I mentioned, a very classical statistical decomposition, and that's bias, variance, and noise. When I show that graph of different races and the zero one loss, many people think of sample size as contributing to a model performing poorly. An astute observer, someone you know, paying close attention on Zoom right now would have seen that the Asian group, which is about 5% of the US population, um, had extremely large confidence intervals in that graph. So they might think, oh, because the Asian population is so poorly represented in the data set, um, that's why the model is performing poorly for it. One group is much smaller and therefore has worse error. That would correspond to variance in this setting. So um, that it, it, the description is sort of, it's that sample size affects accuracy. And the way to fix it would be to collect more data. That would sort of be our direct solution for this particular cause. But there may be other things that can contribute. Um, for example, statistical bias here refers to how well a model fits the data set. You can think of linear and nonlinear models. You could have nonlinear data, but you're only fitting it with a linear model. Um, similarly, there's another term called noise, which refers to the irreducible error. For example, if measurements are faulty, maybe you're just not measuring it in the same way for both groups. Um, and that leads to a result, which is that even if you had infinite data, even if you had all the data in the world and the most powerful model classes, the data you're collecting is too noisy. And you cannot fix the model error. The reason that it's important to start thinking about these different kinds of decomposition is because we would take very different actions to fit any discrimination based on which component is contributing. Um, I've given you the decomposition, decomposition definition of this table, but I find it helpful to think through a visual example. So consider fitting a line to this data. It has an underlying data generating function. For example, orange dots and blue dots both come from these parallel lines, but we don't observe the true data generating function. We try to fit, if we try to fit a model for this data, we could use one model, or if we took the group value as input to the model, so we knew what color the dot was, we could actually learn two separate models. But either way, ultimately what we'll find is that the fit for the orange dots is so much worse than the fit for the blue dots. We call this error due to variance, and we would solve it, oh, we would solve it by collecting a lot more orange dots. That would help us get a closer fit for the orange dot system. In another case, we might have data from two groups again, orange dots, blue dots, 25 dots each. However, no matter if we fit one model or two models, 
we see that the error for the orange group is again higher, despite having roughly equal data points. Because the orange dot generating function is quadratic, um, the model class is ill-suited for the orange group compared to the blue group. And we would call this error oh, orange dot model error, blue dot model error. And we would call this model, um, we would call this error due to bias. And that's because of the model class is not well fitted. Oh. So yes, so it's quadratic as, as unveiled by this function. And we would say that we should change the model class. Lastly, our last example, again, orange dots, blue dots. Um, but now, no matter what model we choose, we can see that the average error for the orange dots is going to be higher compared to the average error of the blue dots. Even if we had a ton of dots from both groups, even if we had the right model class, which is linear, which it is drawn from, we would call this error due to noise. Um, and this one is a bit trickier and we would actually recommend collecting more features. It's not about collecting more data points, but it's finding out what are the actual covariates, what are the actual features for each data point that we should be seeing that could help us learn better for this group, for this orange group. Um, so I've showed you visually how variance, statistical bias, and noise can affect the differences in performance between the two subgroups. In our paper, the one that this, this part of the talk is based on, um, we formalize this decomposition to any group-based fairness metric. And once we know that this decomposition can take this form, the practical question becomes, how can we estimate these terms? Um, how can we figure out which component is contributing to this massive error in the first place? Um, as another part of our contribution, we did estimation techniques. So we can start to almost debug the model error and figure out which of these is contributing the most. These techniques then can, can, can contribute to efficient resource allocation for addressing algorithmic bias. So earlier I described the task of predicting hospital mortality from clinical notes using the MIMIC-3 data set on patients, specifically using um, clinical notes from the first 48 hours of the patient's stay, we tried to predict hospital mortality for patients post 48 hours. So when we subsample the data, we can actually use what's called an inverse power law to model these type two learning curves to estimate the asymptote. Um, this allows us to figure out that our noise and bias term. So if you just look at these lines, the black line is sort of, they're all sort of flattening, flattening out. They're going to hit their asymptote. And if you sort of imagine them extrapolating out, you can see that they're not going to flatten out the same place. They're going to end up somewhere else. They're going to end up in a separated world still. And that means that if we get to infinite data, tons and tons of data, it's still going to be a huge difference. And that's quite meaningful in that it's not just variance. It's not just not having enough data points. And in fact, our noise and statistical bias terms are still remaining and still contributing to any differences in model error. Another concern might be differences in noise, as I mentioned. And here we've identified subpopulations through topic modeling to figure out where um, error rates differ between groups the most. And this can really help identify what kinds of additional features co to collect, which could then reduce the noise. Um, I want to call out that a lot of this work sort of lives in a vacuum or it lives in a more intellectual academic world where we come up with these synthetic data or these observational data sets. But something I'm really proud of with this work is that we actually use these techniques in collaboration with Independence Blue Cross, which is a health insurer serving uh, Philadelphia in the larger Pennsylvania area. So uh, currently we're in the process of auditing and addressing any kind of algorithmic bias that exists in their internal algorithms, specifically ones facing high-risk pregnancy or likelihood of hospitalization, for example. So in this section, I walked through an example of how we can define protocols for auditing and addressing algorithmic bias. And specifically, I demonstrated how to both visually and formally mathematically decompose sources of discrimination into bias, variance, and noise. When you think about how you might examine any kind of decisions about your your algorithmic bias in our in, in algorithms, it's important to know how these three components can require different techniques for estimation and then mitigation. Um, and although I focused on healthcare settings today, I want to challenge everyone to think about other high stakes settings where we use machine learning, things like finance, education, climate, where we can care about differences in performance by subpopulation.
So that is how I thought about, you know, you find the by through the bias audit, you find these these dis disparities in algorithmic performance. What can you do afterwards? But actually, I have a whole other branch of my work that focuses on the other half, which is even before you get to the equity audit, even before you start auditing your model, how can we build these not this domain knowledge about the model, about the world where the data comes into, um, directly into the machine learning model itself? So I want to talk about what it means to broaden the definition of machine learning for equity. The second project I want to talk about today looks at how to build algorithms that are equity aware, I'll call them. So rather than waiting for after a model is built and deployed and debugging it, how can we build these kinds of principles and awareness? Um, specifically, I'll walk through an example of building algorithms that learn differences in access to care, and I'll explain how we can improve sub disease subtyping models through a better algorithm and some theoretical guarantees. Um, and then lastly, I think it's incredibly important to make sure that our models work in the real world, and so we actually looked at real clinical data gathered from a hospital in downtown Boston. Um, if you recall from the last part, we had this really clean decomposition, statistical bias, variance, and noise. The truth is, is that noise component contains a lot of hidden depth. Specifically, there's a lot of different reasons why different groups might have measurements that are of different noise values. Here, I show three systemic health disparities that could easily explain some of those noise, noise values. Um, today's talk was mainly going to focus on different disparities in access to care, but I want to call out that disparities in treatment and disparities in outcomes can have very real effects on clinical algorithms. Um, the clinical motivation, though, is disease subtyping, which is a method to help us better understand diseases. Biologically, we may call one disease the same name, something like breast cancer, but we know now it can manifest differently and react very differently to treatment. A famous example in breast cancer is that the cancer cells can grow in response to many different chemicals, for example, estrogen, progesterone, or a growth-promoting protein that's on the outside of all breast cancer cells called HER2. And how many of these receptors the cancer cells have is very key for planning treatment and therefore the overall progression of the patient. Scientists and clinicians have been very interested in how chronic conditions develop over time, and it turns out many chronic conditions can develop completely differently, despite all being labeled the same disease. It's not just breast cancer. Here we have famous examples of machine learning being used for disease subtyping for asthma, autism, and then today we'll talk about heart failure. Our goal is to use machine learning to find similar patients to each other. Unlike the previous example, which looked at supervised learning, um, today I'm going to talk about, or for this portion, I want to talk about finding subtypes through clustering methods in an unsupervised approach. We could use these kinds of findings, findings for better understanding the disease, we could design future clinical research, and we could screen for clinical trials, for example. Um, and ideally, in our ideal, idealized health data world, we'd want to learn from longitudinal observational data. So here I have a very simplified diagram of what I mean by that. Let's say we have three patients, A, B, and C, and we only have one biomarker that's collected at different times for the three different patients. Here, darker means that the biomarker value is more severe. Looking at this patient A and B start mild, and they get a lot more severe. C seems to start severe, and then it gets more and more mild instead. So it almost goes the, the reverse direction. Because A and B sort of follow the same trajectory over time, if we were to find disease subtypes, it really seems like they should be assigned to the same disease subtype or the same cluster, so to speak. However, dun, 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 we don't live in idealized health data world. If you paid attention to anything in the talk, you're gonna, I hope you take this away, which is that healthcare data is really like doing machine learning on hard mode. There's so many different confounding factors. Here, we can see that data is only observed for a known interval. Um, we call this interval censorship. It can be censored at the beginning, left censorship, or the end. The beginning, uh, the end would be called right censorship. If it's censored at the beginning, this could be because of things like your geographic proximity to a hospital, or your general trust and comfort to the healthcare system, or your insurance coverage. The right censorship could be because uh, canonically studied in survival analysis, and this is because of something like um, patient death, an adverse, adverse event removes a patient from the data set collection. 
Today, I want to talk about left censorship specifically and how to account for the fact that different people come into the hospital, start getting collected on at different times. So I want to emphasize here that even if you're um, even if we, you're not directly concerned with equity and fairness, this kind of censorship can create erroneous subtypings if applied pretty naively. When we think through ways to learn disease subtyping, we have a few options. Um, the canonical way, the way that a lot of people do it, and I've done it before, is to manually align these subtypes. Maybe we have context clues, maybe we have domain knowledge about the disease. This can be tricky, though, because we're often relying on our clinical collaborators to manually label different patients. This is very time expensive. And in cases where we don't know that much about the disease, they might not even know, excuse me, what the true alignment of a person should be. The second option is to choose some seemingly reasonable excuse me, because I have like, I think I have the hiccups, um, some seemingly reasonable point to align all the patients by, for example, first hospital visit. And the third is to model the alignment variables as a latent variable. But let's zoom in, let's double click on option two. Um, what would it look like and potentially why might it be problematic? We're back to our old friends, patient A, B, and C. Let's assume that although the time series are censored, they're sort of blocked out by these gray boxes. Um, let's see what happens if we align them by the time that we start observing data. So a lot of times data sets will align by first patient visit. We see here that patient A has significantly more unseen data, which is a long gray box, but we don't see it. And patient B has basically no unseen data, so it's less affected. Patient C has some in the middle. Um, remember earlier that we said A and B are like best buds. They should be in the same subtype because they have the same mild to moderate to severe progression, the same subtype. If we line up by data set entry here, A and B actually look very different, right? If we were able to slide A to the right a little bit, we would see that A is just B with the first few visits chopped off. However, if we don't allow for learning the alignment for some sliding in at all, we might get incorrect subtypes. Uh-oh. That was, that's why option two is really not an option for us. We'd like to be able, and in fact, for our models, we use option two as a baseline. Instead, our goal is to learn both alignment and subtype, subtype jointly. Um, we develop a deep generative model called Sublime that learns the alignment of a patient, meaning how much left censorship is involved, as well as the subtype of the disease, meaning which phenotype is involved. Both the alignment and the subtype assume continuous values um, for the greatest amount of expression in the model. Um, and specifically, we derive this graphical model when we learn it, uh, we, uh, and then we learn it using a variational inference approximation. Um, we consider questions of identifiability, which I'll get into in a second. And then we also show experiment results that recover known findings on heart failure patients and Parkinson's disease patients. But first and foremost, how are we modeling our clinical data? The biomarkers are measurable indicators of disease severity, and we'd like to be able to take any kind of irregularly sampled multivariate time series that the hospital system is collecting. Here we have glucose, we have creatinine, and BNP is a um, blood hormone that's made by your heart when pressure builds up. We would like to be able to handle all this different kind of data. And the way we do that is we actually encode missing values with NAN values. Um, so if there are missing values, the biomarkers in that visit are just missing. And that allows us to be very flexible with our model. For similar patients, um, backing up, we'd like to learn two latent variables. One is the um, latent representation space. This is our subtype thing. Uh, subtype value, but we're specifically learning a continuous latent representation. We want our good buddies A and B to live close together in a, the latent representation space because they're from the same subtype. Um, because we choose a continuous space here, if we wanted a discrete number of subtypes, we only wanted three subtypes or four subtypes, at a, as a last post hoc step, we can cluster on this discrete, on this latent, on continuous latent space itself. And then also, importantly, we'd like to learn a latent alignment value. Here, this corrects for how much the data has been slid. 
recall that uh, patient A waited a long time before coming in. There's a lot of delayed entry, in which case delta A is much lower, uh, sorry, is much higher than delta B. If there's no delay at all, delta just becomes zero. Um, we also model our alignment value and disease heterogeneity into the observed data space um, using the given uh, specified model. Notably, there's sort of, I, I would say, uh, in, the, in light of all of the symbols on the screen, I would like to focus on one thing, which is that um, this y equals f of x plus delta um, given some parameters theta. So all that means is that we observe some value x but that might not be, so maybe that's time zero when patient, when patient first came in, but that might not be the patient's true disease state. Maybe they waited three years before they came in, in which case the delta, which we're trying to learn would be how much long, how long did they wait in this disease setup that makes it easier for us to learn this disease um, trajectory, in which case our, the true time is then X plus delta. If they came in as soon as the disease started, delta zero, and it just becomes X. Um, and then Y becomes the observed biomarkers that we see. So once we specify this generative model, we, as I mentioned, perform inference. Um, because the model is a non-linear latent variable model, we maximize a variational lower bound on the conditional likelihood of the data. Um, specifically, we choose these Q distributions to make the inference problem more tractable. Um, here, Q is par parameterized by a normal distribution both times. Then we use subgradient ascent for delta and derive updates for their loss function. At a high level, so we've, we've outlined the data generative process and the representation inference process at a high level. Um, when we implement it, it's a um, an architecture very similar to a variational autoencoder. So here we use a recurrent neural network as an encoder, um, and then we use a fully connected decoder um, from the latent space. We train on 60% of the data, we validate on hyper, using hyperparameter tuning on 20% of the data, and then we report results on a held out 20% of the data. So we have this algorithm now, seems pretty promising. One of the things we should ask in the first place is when do we know if we will recover the right subtypes? What, what if it's almost impossible to do to do this problem? Identifiability is a property in math that refers to the fact that in this case, one subtype configuration could generate the observed data that we see. If there's, for example, too much censorship here, we've really extended out the gray boxes, multiple types of subtypes could generate our data and we might not learn the one that we like. In this visual example, I've censored so much so that A, B, and C actually all look like the same kind of patient. Um, and so we wouldn't be able to really recover the true subtype because A and B are so obscured. And C is also, and it would look like they're all the same subtype. We give some condition, uh, in order to solve this, we think on the theoretical level, which is, are there some conditions where we can learn subtype and alignment and how do we show that? And we in fact do prove theoretically, that under some conditions, we can in fact learn this version of Sublime. Um, so I've showed you the model, I've showed you identifiability concerns. Um, how well do we actually do on like actual clinical data? So we evaluated Sublime on two data sets, but today I wanna to talk through the heart failure observational data set in collaboration with uh, Dr. Stephen Horn using the um, uh, data from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And our goal is to examine how the learned subtypes that we found from this model um, uh, relate to known subtypes of heart failure. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, heart failure, um, right now cardiologists separate heart failure into two types. There is diastolic and systolic, basically relating to how strong the heart is, how much blood can pump back out. Um, there's a lot of unknown about diastolic though, which is that even when the heart can pump out all of the blood, something else is going, something else is going wrong and they don't really understand. It seems like it's pumping out all the, it's pumping through the blood very efficiently, but something else is going wrong. So we'd love to dive into maybe more than two types of subtypes. What else is going on there? So let's check out how our subtypes compare. The one thing, so first we run Sublime. And like I mentioned, as a post hoc step, we can cluster the latent representation space using k-means for three clusters. Because heart failure has two subtypes traditionally, we're curious what a third subtype might look like. 
And the way that we evaluate subtypes, which in unsupervised learning is traditionally a very difficult task, is we run Sublime on echocardiogram values. So these are extracted values from ultrasound videos of the heart, but we evaluate them on demographic and symptomatic features that are not used in Sublime at all. So if the sub, uh, cluster, subtypes that we learned seem to show differences in demographic and symptomatic features, we can say that, oh, this is how we can characterize these different clusters, and we can align that, we can uh, compare that with known clinical findings. Um, we also perform a correction because we're doing so many statistical tests here. We perform a false, uh, false discovery rate correction of 0 0.05. So here we report the cluster means for each feature, um, and we only report the statistically significant ones here. There's 11 of them total. Um, it's a lot of data, so let me walk you through what you're seeing right now. One, I mentioned that systol systolic, and hist um, uh, systolic and diastolic heart failure are the two known clusters. And of our three clusters, we see that A, uh, A, is more diastolic and C is more systolic. That's because in the column with A, there's 50% of the patients have the systolic, um, oh, 50% of the patients have a diastolic heart failure diagnosis. And um, for C, 53% uh, of them, of patients in that cluster have a systolic uh, heart failure diagnosis. Interestingly, B seems to be a mix of the two. The fact that systolic and diastolic are, are statistically significant is very important because it confirms that our algorithm is able to recover known clinical subtypes and suggest characterizations for a third. When we compare clusters to other baselines, for example, not learning any alignment or a more greedy approach using something like k-means directly, they were not able to find this dichotomy. More interestingly, though, there are different demographics who seem to be affected by uh, uh, and characterized in these clusters. So, for example, cluster B, which is this mixed diastolic systolic cluster, is characterized by a higher rate of obese patients. Um, and in our cluster A, uh, so the obese patients, 65% of patients in cluster B are have a diagnosis of obesity. And then cluster A, 71% of the patients in cluster A, remember with, is our diastolic, our traditional diastolic heart failure cluster, 71% um, of our patients are women. This actually matches findings in the last five years. This is something that we have just started to learn about how um, again, diastolic heart failure is when your heart seems to be pumping completely normally, but you're still experiencing heart problems. And now we're starting to be able to parse out, okay, what populations are most affected and perhaps what other um, diagnosis uh, patterns can emerge in our subtypes that we have learned. All right, zooming back out today, I walked through an example of how we can make an equity aware, um, equity aware algorithm. I demonstrated how to, by learning a latent space, latent representation space, learn a deep generative model for disease subtyping and alignment. It's not always clear that we can disentangle disease subtyping and alignment. So here I provide conditions under which we can prove that the disease subtypes are identifiable. The sublime algorithm improves over several competitive baselines, including one that ignores all alignment information, but uses the same neural network architecture. And I, I think sort of zooming out even more, my hope is that if you're listening on this particular section, you think about the different ways, the different underlying forces, the different latent variables that are in your model that may be affecting the observational data that you see. In the case of you know, longitudinal observational disease subtyping analysis, this access to care delay is something that is not often studied, but in fact can be incredibly important for learning true subtypes and also is related to disparities in care. So thinking about what kinds of underlying factors are contributing to your data and figuring out how to work with that is an incredibly important way to um, improve, bring equity to the entire machine learning pipeline. Um, and that brings me to sort of a wrap up thing, a uh, wrap up thought. So today I talked about two of the, the last two stages here, algorithmic development and post-deployment considerations. Um, 
And although that's mainly what I was able to present today, I'm looking forward to having discussions with people here and, and focusing my research on the earlier stages of the pipeline as well. So to briefly call it out, you know, there are questions about problem specification. So there exist populations and diseases that are understudied by the existing machine learning uh, learning for healthcare literature. Um, I have a, a large project on domestic violence that precisely tries to address this question, which is what are the underspecified, understudied questions that we should be focusing our magnifying glass on? Second, once a problem is identified and funded, the way we collect data and the populations we include must be carefully considered. Um, for example, making sure that we represent all of the populations we're concerned about, as was brought up earlier in the talks today. Um, outcome definition then becomes even more important. This is the choice of the label. label. Um, this can have large impacts on the problem formulation. One of my co-authors, uh, co Ziad Obermeyer, has a paper where using cost as the label for prediction has racial disparities, whereas using health need as the label did not in uh, induce these racial disparities. So having some very methodological ideas about what outcomes we're choosing and how that might impact the equity of your algorithm is incredibly important. So. Um, um, and as I, as I mentioned today, algorithm development and host deployment consideration will continue to be important as we expand the use of machine learning for healthcare. Um, I'll go ahead and conclude there. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me either now or later, um, but also feel free to reach out by email or by Twitter. Um, I'm available in many different forms. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as before, please feel free to unmute yourselves or stick a question in the chat. And as before, I'm going to take advantage of uh, being the one speaking right now uh, to ask one really um, maybe slightly technical question. Maybe it's a silly question, but when you are defining your fairness metric, you are bringing together um, bias, variance, and noise. And I guess what I was thinking is the, what is the sort of scaling or is this a, you know, when I think about a mean squared error, we have sort of bias squared and variance to so try to put these on the same unit or the same scaling. And so I was wondering what the, the thinking was on the scaling to have, you know, bias and noise, I think would be on the same scale or the same unit, but variance would be on a squared. So I was just wondering what the, the, hmm. the idea was behind that. That's a really astute question, Erica. Um, luckily, I think our, our work builds on existing work that looks at this specific decomposition for error. Mm -hmm. So forget anything okay. about you know, discrimination or, or ethics, um, there is a known result, which is that when you look at something like accuracy and you decompose mm -hmm. that, it is the coefficients for bias, variance, and noise are all one. So it's a very mm -hmm. nice linear result, no square terms that relates. If you start to do things like precision, recall, positive predictive value, other things that you may be interested in, it remains an open question how to um, scale these terms perhaps, or if you should weight one more, or how how to go about the computation of a decomposing a more sophisticated loss function. But for the moment, the reason that I focus primarily on accuracy um, is because you have this very nice linear non-squared uh, coefficients of one um, relationship. It's really fascinating. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes left before the break. If anyone else wants to, uh, as I said, unmute or, or put a question in the chat, please feel free. Hi. Uh Oh, sorry, someone else up there. I can't. Uh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so much fantastic stuff here. And and I, I'm not sure, I hope I didn't miss anything. But um, so I was just thinking about the uh, censoring and the left censoring in particular, and how it's very likely um, gender biased. Um, and so, you know, you mentioned the 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 algorithm can help identify um or that your and I, I can't remember what it was called but can help identify gaps in research but potentially also and maybe this is something you're already doing can help identify gaps in collection of data right and and provide guidance on okay we need to and and it may not even be that the data um has to be absent like you could have a female or a male come to a doctor's office one gets the test one doesn't and at that decision making point say oh no we need to test even if it 
you, you know what I mean, you know what I'm saying. Absolutely. That's a great point, Kate. I think, um, you know, for the purposes of the talk, I simplified things really, really down, but I want to call a uh, action to, I want to call back to one of this slide that I had, which where today we focused on access to care, just that people just delay, people have different delays when they come in and they don't get as much care maybe earlier on, and that might impact their trajectory later. That, those are sort of known problems there. What you're describing is disparities in treatment, which is that two people who have the same symptoms might come in and because of whatever function of the healthcare system might get different treatments. They just get different medications, different diagnoses, or alternatively, two people who have um, who manifest slightly differently, maybe they have heart attacks that have different symptoms, might need the same treatment, and in fact are not getting treatment because they manifest slightly differently. And these are all sort of nuances, and I think what you're pointing to is that the, the way that clinical decision-making now happens is not equitable. So, you know, if I could have another half hour to talk about research, I think we could flip it on its head, which is to say, are there ways that we could use machine learning now to start to analyze existing health disparities and figure out if we could fix those? Can we identify when the system is giving people differences in treatment, differences in testing, differences in care overall? And can we figure out um, ways that machine learning could help automate that and maybe reduce some bias in the system? So I think those are all really interesting research questions. And thank you so much for sort of alluding to them, Kate. And it, it's definitely not a solved problem by any means, but I think it is starting to fit into a framework of um, re-examining everything, question everything, and figure out you know where the best data practices can be coming. Thank you. Um, Alexandre, I see you're unmuted. Did you have a question before we take our break? Yeah, I was, I'm trying to understand exactly what are the assumptions when you deal with censoring. So you, you censoring can be dependent on observed variables, but I suppose um, just not clear. I mean, exactly what? So you, you try to base on imperfect observations to, to, to assign the characteristics that will be predictive of, of censoring. It's not, not clear. Is there some kind of assumption that you have like, uh, you have uh, no, uh, I mean, it's like a missing at random assumption here yeah, that you have given the observed data, you don't miss any information or could there be some missing information? That's a great way of framing it. So um, here we're assuming that the um, delay, the censorship value is um, able to be learned from the existing data. So of the data, of the, multi the multivariate, a regularly sampled time series that we do observe, we are assuming that you can learn this latent variable of censorship delay um, in order to learn the overall disease subtyping. That is one of our assumptions, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, although we would, as I mentioned, in the identifiability results, um, there are cases where this is not true. And that's mm -hmm. sort of what we uh, try to carefully specify out. Okay, this is, would be completely impossible and this is more possible and that's where we keep our analysis. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we will take a short 15 minute break.